So again, <clears throat> um, please let me know if you if you'd rather your uh, if you want to ask a question and you'd rather that the, your question or the interaction wasn't recorded. Um, just let me know. I press pause. Anybody, please. Is that Nick? Um, okay, so let me let me see if I can summarize that. Um, <clears throat> Nick's saying that uh, just getting very interested in the interface between the the senses or the images of self and healing the self and the emptiness of self and the different pathways that are sort of taught or offered through that that mixture. Would that be a way of rephrasing what you said? Yeah. Um, and so in some Buddha Dharma, um, for instance, may, maybe the, well, in some Buddha Dharma, um, th there's this teaching that the self is, is empty, but it has this connotation, therefore, that it's kind of almost not worth bothering about. In, in the sense of the, the richness of the personality or the depth of the personality, it's just a, it's just a fabrication, it's just a construct, it's just an illusion. Um, and, and we're kind of op opening that out to other possibilities. Um, Is there a question there? Is that what, what is what is what is being healed, or or yeah, is that? Bit. It's important, but can, yeah. I wonder if we can just kind of. Is it possible to? Yeah, it's kind of what is being healed. What, what happens? Like in, in your experience, or what happens to yourself? Like, what is Okay, so, um, <coughs> um, so in a way, there's one pathway that maybe just let go of the self, it's irrelevant, just deconstruct it or see that it's empty, and, and that's sort of, and then there's this, this kind of, uh, as you said, psychological sort of dictum or, or maxim, 
well, you have to have a self before you let go of it. And so one kind of builds that solid sense of self and a sense of self-identity and all that. And then maybe you do the emptiness stuff. And where does the imaginal come in in all of that? Is that, yeah, okay, so... Um, you, 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 you may pick up something common in in sort of answers I give which is like yes it's all good <laughs> it's all it's all like available um and helpful you know the different angles on things I think um I don't really I'm not really sure what to say right now about the middle one um and are are you saying that you feel ambivalent about that building building up the self or what what are you what are you saying where you're at with that middle psychological dictum yeah 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 well it gets made uh, it gets given dimensionality, and it gets given a, a rootedness or a sense of origin in divinity, for a start. Um, and that's huge. That's that's absolutely massive. That's not the typical Western sense or idea of self. We don't. Uh, we, we tend to be suspicious if someone has that kind of sense of themselves that somehow they're rooted in, in divinity. In a very, not not just in a in a kind of universal sense that we're all rooted in, we're all children of God, etc. We're all uh, part of the universal oneness of whatever that universal oneness stuff is. But in the very particular sense that you, with your um, the uniqueness of, of your manifestation, the uniqueness of your personality, the uniqueness of even the difficulties that you, that you encounter and the story of your life and the, and the, the, um, even the tragedies that you're handed or that I'm handed, um, that this is somehow, uh, we get a sense in, in this kind of middle way sense that that's given from the divine or given uh, to us in in our uniqueness our uniqueness our unique journey is uh ne- is is actually rooted in god has its origins in the divine use whatever language help, helps you here um i am an angel you you are a, you are angels all of that and the journey that i'm on or what's handed to me in my life this cancer that i might die of this this is somehow necessary to the divine now i'm not going to reify that and cling to it but there's a kind of view and and actually a sensing with soul that i can enter into with something like this is a part of the narrative of my life it's a it's a fact but it's multi-dimensional and it has it's given place given meaning given depth given divinity given um a sacredness that pertains to its uniqueness your uniqueness do you, do you, do you understand that's healing at a whole other level a whole other level, and so it, it's like I, I talk about me right now. So, so, let's say I die from the cancer. Uh, there's a healing that happens at a whole other level, whether or not I die. Do, do you understand? So, and and um, some of the um, less less uh, socially sanctioned uh, kind of corners and angles and protuberances and ways of our personhood um, might be sometimes the healing is to soften them to change them to make them more uh, uh, less less dukkha and sometimes the healing is at another level so and so is still an arrogant uh, you know uh, <laughs> so so and so is still um uh belligerent they're, they're always like you know fighting for this cause and and being you know on the edge of being obnoxious or whatever it is you know it's like what, what does healing look like you, you sand everything down so it's all it's all like ev- let's make everything polished and kind of bland and, and beige um or or is it that there's an angel in that in that very difficulty somehow and then then the question is an open one is like Okay, how much does it need 
A, transforming, so that I'm not just stuck in something that's actually not soulful. So that's always the thing, what, what's soulful, you know? But also it's just not, it's just not kind of pointless dukkha, you know? Um, how much does it need to be transformed? How much does it need to be blessed by this other sense of it, you know? And the healing is, is in that. And, and also how much freedom is there? Because the other aspect of healing might be, and this may be, also we could say where it ties in with emptiness, is emptiness of self, is to see that we're, we're multiple. That's why I said you're angels. You're not just one. It, it, yeah. And so um, there's not so much rigidity. You see how my personality or my the, the, the patterns that I, that I um, uh, uh, manifest in my life, in relationship, in thinking, in expression, in my work, in my the way I move my body, it's like they can get very rigid. It's just like, okay, that, that person just always, I always do things this way. And I realize I don't, I don't even realize that I'm stuck in it, or maybe I do realize. So one of the things with soul, and we've kind of implied this in what we've been saying, is that there's a certain freedom in just in having more range and having the flexibility. I, I can have the light and I can have the dark. I can have the, um, the raging God and I can have the, the God of infinitely soft benevolence. I can, all as me and into me and through me and all that, I can have, the, as we said today, the stillness and the movement that, do you understand? So I'm not, I'm less fixated on one self being how I am and I open to the, um, Hillman would call it the polytheism, the multiplicity of, of the angels that come through me, come through you, that speak to you, that want something from you. Yeah, and so there's something that's um, liberating in the sense of breaking out of a rigidity and an enclosedness in in recognizing the multiplicity of of what's coming through me and what's being asked of me and what what my soul relationships are with, with angels, divinities, images, etc. Yeah, where that ties in with emptiness again. This this uh, is a little bit related to what I said this morning. Is that so again, with a certain kind of, I would say, not, not fully uh, deep understanding of emptiness, then, then we say, oh, the self is empty, therefore it's worthless, therefore we kind of just, kind of, we'd be better off without it somehow. And we have this image like a liberated person sort of doesn't have one, or, or they're kind of, so what, what, what is that? Um, <laughs> And is that even something that I, I want? You know, so there's a kind of just it's always put put down and put aside and kind of or it's tolerated. We tolerate you have this personality, Keva has this personality, it's okay, it's just personality, it's just form. And we don't get too hung up about it. So it's kind of neither um particularly attacked or or celebrated or seen as divine, this the self and the, the expressions of the self. If we go deeper into emptiness, like I said this morning, you see that the very fact that any any self um, construction at all is empty means that I'm I'm free to construct the self any old how. And if I'm strictly in a in a Buddha Dharma gear, I'll say the constructions of self are for the purpose of reducing dukkha. If I'm expanding that a bit more, and there's all questions here about paradigms and where they fit, but when we expand it a bit more, I could say the, the constructions of self at any time, the images of self, can be in the service of soulfulness, and that may overlap completely with the with the, the quieting of dukkha, the, the the dissolving of dukkha, or it might be it's not quite that simple. But the very fact of the emptiness of the thorough, complete emptiness of self. Totally, um, a- any conception of self is empty. Um, allows other, other uh, um, allows us to to fabricate and the self to be fabricated in different ways. And we can just we see it's all play, it's all theatre, and and we can be moved by theatre and play. And uh, it, you understand? Does, does it make sense? Um, What do you think? Is that... that yeah. Um, <laughs> good. Um, 
And and like you said, just to say what you said, and, and then sometimes there's always this gear. You know, we're not kind of emphasizing it so much on this retreat. The last retreat, um, partly because we called it of hermits and lovers, the alchemy of desire. Uh, so we didn't want everyone kind of like, you know, blowing fuses and things. Um, so we, we just spent a day talking about letting go, you know. It's like, so that's a gear too. And and this gear of like, yeah, shoring up the self and, and getting a really solid sense of self, where my boundaries are and who I am and all that. To I go back to what I said right at the beginning, it's like, all good. All these directions are good. Sometimes I think as a general point, you know, um, I, I want to say that um, it's a little bit like the only mistake we can make is is to only to be stuck in one way of seeing things one way of thinking about the self or relating to the self for example yeah whatever that is it won't it it, it doesn't have that flexibility that malleability the fluidity the the range that that is i think uh, an uh, a result and an expression an embodiment of of freedom it's range flexibility in thinking, in acting, in relating, in meditating, in yeah. So, so I'm just echoing what you said that actually that they're all good, yeah. And and then the R is like when, when, when is what, what's helpful when and in what ways. Is that? So yeah, very, really good insight, Nick. So basically, uh, Nick's saying that any, e- even if she's in the mode or, or the thinking of shoring up boundaries and sh- shoring up the self and really setting boundaries and being clear about that, that's sort of something that is maybe more typical of modern psychology in the West. Um, then even that endeavour and even that way of way of viewing things can be in the language we've been using, can be sensed with soul. So that whole that whole idea and that whole movement and that whole in, endeavor and everything that's involved in that, it can have all the dimensionality <coughs> and all the kind of, um, you know, divine referencing and context and blessing and sacredness and duty and all the other list business. Um, uh, it, it's the same thing, but it's seen with, it's sensed with soul. You understand? So, absolutely. And there's a big difference between that and and seeing it more rigidly, um, which is still, can be still really, really helpful, seeing it more kind of flatly, if you like. Yeah? Really, yeah, good and cool. Thank you. Uh, ah, sorry. Um, yes, well, Robert had his hand up before, so I'll, I'll come back. Yeah, I'll try to. Well, I'm grateful if you could... Uh, explain how strong emotions other than love relate to sensing the soul. You mean more difficult emotions? Yeah, like grief and <clears throat> anger. Yeah, so the question is how um, strong emotions and more difficult emotions like anger or grief relate to sensing the soul. Uh, other diff- uh, emotions other than love. and uh, uh, Yeah. So, first thing to say is, love can also be soulless, relatively, or yeah, everything's a spectrum. So, you know, I can uh, love some something, and it doesn't have that dimensionality and divinity. Yeah. So, love is a an aspect of sensing the soul, but it's not by itself enough. Yeah. Um, anger, for instance. Uh, Are you saying how would you work with it? Is the question, or just how does it fit con- no, conceptually? So it does it have a legitimate place at the table in addition to the twenty-eight notes? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yes. Um, it, it, what, but but it's more like. Um, it, it relates to Nick's question a little bit. It's like whatever is coming through can be um, 
spun off into papancha can be <coughs> ignored, dismissed, ridiculed, uh, transcended somehow, uh, um, or <laughs> or um, or related to in a way that that opens up soul. <coughs> so we participate in everything. So it's not here is the anger. Let, well, weave in the practice and the concept. Here, so here yes, I'm sitting. Maybe I don't even realize I'm angry at first. I just feel like hot and bothered, you know. Um, or maybe I feel depressed. Actually, it's, not, it's something about just like, you know. And then I, I say, okay, this is what's... The emotional awareness is absolutely indispensable. To It goes, it's like a absolute part of the foundation of, of, of the practice. So it's like I feel into <coughs> this depression, the kind of heavy cloud of it and and i'm just making this up as a possible and uh and i feel that heaviness and it feels like something's pressing me down and i'm i'm with it and i'm just like man i feel i feel like i've been pressed down a lot in my life you know and then and then it's like you know what i'm 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 really pissed off at being pressed down i i i get angry at the being at the being the depression for instance yeah and then I'm with something slightly different. The depression has, has maybe got a depression and an anger. I'm just making up a possibility. Um, and says, so, okay, that's interesting. Let me feel into the anger. Energy body, what does it need? Maybe it needs love. Maybe it needs metta. That would be one approach. Maybe I just need to kind of let that anger be in the energy body and see what it does. And so there's kindness in the approach, but I'm not trying to change it. Okay, and I'm not either just watching it as sensation. And nor am I just well. Let's, let's just say that. For me, yeah. So I'm. I've got energy body. I've got this. Maybe it feels like there's uh, there's these glowing embers in in my belly, and I and I feel and I can I can feel this, and it's mixed with frustration, and it's confusing, etc. I'm just with it, and I'm holding it. I'm letting something emerge in in the energy body, in the emotionality, in the way I'm tending to it. And then there's a lot of energy wrapped up in anger a lot of uh, emotional energy and a lot of psychic energy wrapped up. And also in some depressions, it's actually, it's a kind of energy that's just trapped and, and either attacking oneself or just locked. There's, and there's not, not all depression, but a lot of depression has a lot of energy. When I start relating to it in this way and, and, and being with it in the energy, when you're kind of being sensitive to it and, and allowing it, uh, but in a, in a very intimate way, um, then the energy, the psychic energy in the emotion may liberate an image. It may generate an image. So it was maybe just embers, and then out of the embers comes some kind of fiery, wrathful deity stomping around and roaring, and he's got trident and a nine-bladed sword and a, you know all the and and uh, all that. And uh, and maybe I'm a little bit scared of this, and maybe I feel like I've become that, or maybe he's looking at me and and engaging with me. Then I'm in in the realm of the imaginal. Now, with that, um, as one of our uh, nodes business is is a sense of duty. So I'm going quite quickly here through the, um, but I might I then you know would engage this this figure, it, or either bec- feel what it feels like to become that figure, or engage. Um, him is uh, in in relationship. I'm in in meditative, um, mindful, sensitive energy, body, emotional awareness to the reson- you know awareness of the reson- relationship. Or how does it feel to become this deity and to see the world and to feel the world? And what does the body feel like? And what do I feel like? At that point, when it has become imaginal, to the degree it has become imaginal, there's something felt. The anger could still be there, but it's it's transformed, but not so much into love or softness or equanimity. It's become uh, it's become a kind of wrathful deity. It's become a creative anger. There's a, there will be a feeling of liberation. So before, I mean, certainly in the example I just gave, started depressed. I felt I felt so. Mm. Then when I feel anger, I start to feel a bit bigger but I still feel caught in the anger so usually we have an unskillful relationship with anger we just feel tied up in it knotted in it when it becomes soulful and imaginal it doesn't feel like a problem anymore and it's not that we just kind of give ourselves license to buy a shotgun and go <laughs> whatever and just you know shoot our mouths off it's something's 
something's changed in the whole nature of, of what it is and what it feels like. And maybe there's a situation. Maybe I have felt depressed because I'm in a situation, uh, or I have been a long time in a situation, where the rules are, of the rules of the engagement in the organization or the family or the relationship or whatever are actually constraining me. So I've got a situation that I'm actually angry about as well. Now the imaginal, in, in this book, we have to be very sensitive and very, very, uh, attuned here and, and also careful. It might give me a duty and a perspective in relation to that situation. Do you understand? So, and that might look like I say something and it has not unkindness. There's a difference between unkindness and wanting to hurt. The Buddha says non-cruelty is one of the three primary uh, intentions in in the Noble Eightfold Path. But it can be sharp and it can be cutting and it can be strong and it can be powerful and it can be angry, you know. But it's it's a very different thing. And the the purpose of it is... is, uh, the sense of it and the purpose of it uh, and the whole experience of it is is much expanded and, and again given dimensionality and a rooting in divinity. Um, I mean, I was I can't remember who I was sharing with this morning. It was Maywa, I think. And I, I, I mean, some of you know this. I I wrote a letter um, many years, not many years ago, some years ago, it, to the Insight Meditation teachers, and it was about um, climate change and and what we're doing or actually what we're not doing in relation to that and uh it 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 wasn't it was there was anger in it and it was obnoxious or it would be easy to read it as obnoxious and i could i could certainly see that way and i think a lot of people found it that way (laughs) and it certainly pissed people off etc i now i could be you know completely off here but i don't regret doing it uh and with all whatever consequences it made and i i think i will I will feel that till till I die. You know, there was something right about it and right about the tone and there was something, to my sense, kind of ar- archetypal coming through. I'm not saying that's the only answer. It was maybe part of a beginning of something that needed lots of other energies. But it felt at the time like there was anger there, there was frustration, etc. And there was a kind of calling that actually in this case needed to manifest. Now, if we go back to the example that we said before, it might be that the duty involved in this image is is just that i've just opened i've just got a different sense of the situation and i find that something's liberated there's still the the heat and the the force and all that but i don't feel i need to do anything i I could but it's i'm not being asked to to do anything or manifest or speak or um and other times we (coughs) we do get a sense of some some kind of duty that's involved in in does this make sense so it's not so much that anger itself is it would be a node as, as much as again anger like anything else is something that can be related to with more or less soul making does that so how does all that sound it sounds yeah it sounds clarifying and useful uh, okay good um And we could give a similar example with grief or whatever, but but I didn't. Does, is there any more? Or? Uh, I mean, the, uh, I'm visited by a couple of Im- images whose beauty and divinity seems somehow dependent on anger yeah. uh, and grief, respectively. Ah, yeah. Uh, and regardless of how long I spend with them, yeah, they, they don't transmute into anything else. It stays yeah. Yeah. in holy grief, holding a dead child. Or Right, right. And so, you know, is that not a part of life? There is tragedy in life, and and one can look at and conceive of tragedy in lots of different ways as a kind of flat existentialist, you know, well, that that's life, you know, or gi- given soul. So again, it's not that somehow the child miraculously comes back to life and everything's rosy and happy forever and ever. Um, there's something in in that particular image that you're describing, um, that, that there, there is this holy grief, there is this re- redemption that happens without without transformation. Is it? It's a transubstantiation more than a transformation. Um, so I don't, you know, it may be they change, and images can sometimes change, and sometimes over a long periods of time, long long periods of time. Um, 
Uh, but it may just stay that, and there's something iconic for you in those images, and they, they've they got something for you. They, they're teaching you something. They're, they're part of the soul-making. And the mind can't quite wrap it. This, this is really important. If the mind feels like it's figured it out, and, the, you know, so it's, it's always got this part of the beyondness. It's got this, like, there's just, I, I get it, sort of, but I don't quite get it, and yet it speaks to me. It, it does something. You, you understand? So your job is, is, is opening to that, resonating with that, following that thread of, of sensibility and sensitivity. Do, does, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, did you have your hand up for you? Uh, uh, okay, okay. Should we do that? Okay, last one. Yeah. A quick, quick question. I think I'm not the only one that's a relative to be beginner to this, but I'm beginning to, to kind of bits are starting to coalesce. So I'm going to ask a simple question: What is soul? It's, I know you probably talked about this in umpteen recordings before. Yeah. Okay. So Jill, Jill, saying I'm I'm a beginner and um. Uh, I'd say we're all beginners, actually, and I, I would definitely say that about myself. Um, and the question is, what is soul? Okay, so it's um, the first thing to say is is just following on from what we said to Robert, and, and I think what I touched on at some point is if there's some really deep ideas in life that we will we will be poorer if we if we put them too much in a box and and we we get a too polished rigid tight definition around so it's like the concept has to have these elastic edges that i was talking about and it has to be a kind of, it has to have some mystery and some that's where its fecundity comes from um so soul is a kind of nebulous concept at one level yeah um we could so having said that, then we could say um, soul is actually just shorthand for a kind of kind of experience, which is all this business that we're talking about. Yeah. So that's putting it as like it's not a thing at all. It's just a kind of way of it. So that's one one conception. Second conception is uh, without giving it inherent existence, we say if soul is some kind of um, entity or belonging to my being or given to me or bigger than my being some kind of entity who's operates in by seeing in these kind of, and sensing in these kind of ways that, that we're talking about now that instrument or organ can get really shrunk it can get atrophied it can lose its blood supply and so that it barely functions in our life or it can grow and get powerful and get more facility and accessibility at, at sensing that way. So how does that sound? That sounds good. <laughs> sounds very good. So I'm assuming that all practices can be soulful. All practices can be soulful. Y- y- yes. Um, um, yes, all practices can be because the, soul- the soulfulness is in a relationship to yeah. something. Okay. Um, so anything can be soulful. However, if I if there's a practice that has <coughs> built-in conceptual limits, yeah. that for example disallow imagination, yeah. disallow uh, any kind of they just have a rigid conception of how things are, um, then they will be soulful up to a certain point for you. If they're new to you, they're all very exciting. So you know, for example, I trained a lot in a kind of atomistic Mahasi style, like look at the moment-to-moment sensation of everything, it's moment-to-moment Vedana and consciousness and and all this, and the body is just atoms and all that. Now at first, that's that's all very new and it's exciting, and everything kind of explodes into this mist of atoms and it's all really (coughs) fast, and it's like, it's thrilling. But then, then when the implicit or explicit teaching is, this is reality, that's it, Anything else is is kind of delusion and nonsense. Then then um, the soul has kind of it. It's been stretched up to that point. It's like all this is new. There's the expansion of soul making there. The expansion of new vistas, new senses of things. The excitement of the eros. But then when it's been there for a while, it 
there's no more soul making. So, so there's something dynamic in soul making, something expansive. And if it reaches a wall, either it it pushes that wall outwards. So there's more territory, new discoveries, new new ideas, new perceptions, new senses of things, new ideas, new sense of self, new sense of the world. Pushes it usually quite slowly, or it just blows through the damn wall and and and, and uh, I've talked about it's breaking the vessels. It just shatters things, and that can be a bit like whoa. Yeah. Um, and then and then maybe you get you build new ones that are bigger. They've got more range in them, or the walls are stronger than, than the dynamic of soul making and, and the, the psyche and the life just stay within those walls. Yeah. And then what happens? Get stuck. Well, it it's stuck or so, something gets, you know, it just, it, 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 just it grinds to a halt. Yeah, the soul making dynamic doesn't, and, and then we feel that in our life, but because we don't have that language in our culture, we can't say, and we don't have that consequence of that's what's happening. Well, that's what's not happening. Um, so sometimes, or oftentimes in our life, so there's, we're going to meet walls. So even when we're not aware of it, we've got walls of habit, walls of um, energetics, walls of conception, walls of emotion, you know, that, that will block our soul making. That's normal. And then again, it's like, okay, what does this need? Or is it just going to stretch it smoothly and organically and slowly? Is it going to bust them? Is it going to take some other work to look at those walls? And does this make sense? <clears throat> so, um, yes, we, we should probably probably end. I know I didn't. Maybe we can do another day. So, let's have a bit of quiet to finish. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org/slash donate.